Howdy YouTube and welcome to this episode of The Gunman. So today we're going to be doing a Mini Cooper S prep mask and paintwork. So as you can see there, I've got AJ or Alan Jones sanding down the second hand door. So there was a few repairs on it and then we've primed the entire exterior of that door. And then Alan's given it a good block down with the long block. So yeah, basically that's what happens a lot of the time these days. Alan will prep up my bolt-on panels or the parts that aren't on the car. I'll go and do the blends. I'll do my color matching. And usually by that time, we sort of meet each other halfway. By the time I've got my color and my blends done, and my, um, my masking and all that stuff, he'll have those bolt-on panels ready to go in the booth and yeah ready to paint some shit so yeah that, that's another thing that I've actually been doing these days is leaving the car covered while I do my prep work and yeah I mean it only takes an extra minute if that because usually the plastic's already over the car so this car here didn't actually get primed but let's just say a little section of it had been primed I'll just um, reuse that plastic tape it tape around the panel that I need to prep up and um, yeah like it's it's pretty handy for a couple of reasons so it obviously keeps the car cleaner and that's a great thing um, and the other side of it is that you might get say halfway through a job and then um, have to leave the job uh, and then Alan does his prime ups in the workshop so it, it saves him from having to um, throw a piece of plastic over the car again so yeah it's been working well for me I never used to do it but yeah it's I'm always sort of trying new ideas and, you know, happy to, yeah, find new ways to do the job or little tweaks to my current methods and add it to your bag of tricks and make yourself a better all-round painter in the end. So, obviously, I did start off by cleaning these or this panel down. Um, with my methylated spirits or denatured alcohol mixed with water. However, I didn't actually include that footage. I, I wasn't quite sure if I was going to do a video on this. I'm like, yeah, why not get the footage? Um, and then I decided to come home and edit it up this weekend. So, yeah, once I got it all uh, cleaned down, I then um, obviously taped up the surrounding panels with the plastic, as I was just mentioning. Um, and now I'm using a piece of 600 grit on the orbital sander um, and just buzzing over those blends. So I find 600 grit is fine, it's it's all you need to prep up with in solvent. If I was using water I'd probably go 800, so when I was using the Chromax Pro water system I'd always prep up with 800 instead of uh, 600, but yeah, this 600 it just cuts in a little bit quicker and yeah, I find it works a bit better. So what I'm doing here is just um, finding those stone chips, there's a few stone chips and scratches in this blend panel so I always fix them I mean yeah uh, you don't want to go and paint over chips and scratches if you don't have to I mean yeah, yeah I know some people do it and I don't want to be disrespectful to them but it just makes you wonder how much um, you know respect for the, the vehicle you have if you're going and painting over them within reason obviously like if you need to blend the color and it's on a blend panel which this actually is it's still just a blend panel um you know if it's too close to the next panel away and you still need to keep that color small yeah by all means i'll clear over it if i have to but usually at least give it a touch up before i clear it so it's sort of nicely sealed down sometimes what you can do is touch it up and then sand it back if need be and yeah even another thing like had there been a big sharp dent on the front edge of the blend so closer to where the door is not the other end of the blend where I need to actually just put clear coat um, yeah had there have been a sharp dent I would have done it as a freebie I do that all the time we've got some methods to um, speed up the process on things like that you know if it's I don't know I don't like painting over damage however in saying that I actually do paint over a bit of a sharp dent on this car there is an extent like there's only so much that we can do for free like the dent that you you might actually see it later in this video towards the end of it um, it's around near the tail light so it's totally the other end um, of the panel from uh, where we want to be putting color so for us to go and fix that we're gonna have to um, put color right up to the the back of the car and it's just a little bit too much so even this panel here you can see those low spots where the guide coat didn't sand out and I was just giving Alan a bit of instructions on yeah just put a bit of um, two-pack knifing putty into that um, yeah allow it to dry then sand it back and I just actually told him to put a 
put a little bit of 1k primer over the top of it because you don't usually get too many pinholes in your knifing putty um, the fine fiddler um, and then I just said yeah I'll just wet on wet or non sanding primer or seal the entire panel so that's what we did and yeah the end result was great so um, I obviously allowed that two pack knifing putty to dry these days it only takes five minutes really because it's pretty warm and then just getting a nice sharp razor blade and shaving the bulk of the filler off um, yeah with the razor blade and I find that that's the it's better than blocking honestly because even with a block you'll be sanding the surrounding sections so where the fine filler isn't you'll be blocking into it and then when you you're done um, some of the time and a lot of the time you can actually end up with a bit of a shadow of where the filler was so like a little bit of a high spot there so honestly i found this is the best method for removing your fine filler in stone chips and scratches stuff like that obviously if it was a, a dent or you know damage i'm not going to be sanding it out with a uh, a razor blade but yeah obviously be careful with it too um, I don't usually find I have to put bits of tape over the sharp edges of them. Some people do and it works for them. So, you know, if you find that your razor blade is actually uh, chipping into the paint a little bit too much, maybe look at rounding the edges of the blade off or just putting a piece of tape around the edges or something like that, whatever works. And you know, I've found that um, when you're using the razor blade method on removing your filler, all you need to do is orbital sander 600 and that'll cut the rest of it down and you won't be left with any um, any high spots as I said you can actually be left with even when you're blocking so yeah again it's just one of those things that you know I, I never used to do it this way but I've you know trialed different methods and I have found that in in practice this is actually the best way to do it so you know give it a shot yourself you might you might find it doesn't work for you or you might find it's great um, as I say in a lot of my videos, I'm not here to tell you how to do your job I'm just showing you how I do it and you know There might be a few things that I do that you don't and you can try them and if they work for you great um, Go for it and that's uh, That's what this channel is all about just helping people learn how to paint, you know But yeah, what I'm doing now is just going over the edges quickly with a piece of 800 grit one of those softback sanding sponges I love these things so they cut out the orange peel they um, take that top layer of clear coat off um, and then I'll go around the rest of the shiny spots with uh, grey scotch bright pad so it's something I never actually used to do uh, well I mean as I say like my methods have changed so vastly over the years it's not funny and yeah as I say I'm, I'm continually tweaking it and even in the last year like uh, say a year and a half ago I never used to use scotch bright at all I found that you, you and you can like you can actually get all your edges with one of these 800 softback pads but I've found nowadays you just knock the orange peel out and then all the really tricky edges I'll just use a piece of grey scotch bright for so I know a lot of people don't even use these pads at all like most of the guys I work with they'll just go straight from orbital sander to uh, scotch bright but I, I just find that I like to knock a bit of that orange peel out and sort of start fresh with um, yeah, my my coat of clear and another uh, another good thing about um, sanding your blends down properly like this and uh, cutting through that clear coat, uh, a combination of your orbital sanding with 600 or 800 and these 800 sanding pads is that um, you won't get as much of a color difference in applying an extra coat of clear over your blend sections because you've actually sort of taken maybe half a coat of clear off already so um, you're not yeah deepening that color up or the clear coat layers up too much which can not actually change the color but it can cha change the appearance of the color because there's more clear coat and more depth over the panel that you've painted or the blend panel that you've painted so yeah this color here um, actually was edge to edge on the front fender so it's got this tiny little front fender uh, and then that actually goes edge to edge up to the bonnet and the scuttle panel um, and yeah it looks fine I mean it's one of those things no insurance company in the right mind well <laughs> maybe some of them would but they're not going to give you a blend on a bonnet that size and yeah remove and refit on all those parts up on the scuttle panel like your wipers and all that kind of stuff so yeah sometimes you just got to match your colors edge to edge and yeah this one here came up fine I didn't actually include any of the color matching stage um, however I obviously did color match it so I hope you guys have been enjoying the return of the standard format of you know everyday refinishing videos I 
I got a bit over them for a while, honestly. I really did. I just couldn't be bothered making them, and now I'm having a bit of a um, renewed interest in doing these kind of videos. So, as I say, hopefully you guys are enjoying them. Um, a big part of it was getting that new intro, so the, the way that actually happened is the guy I work with, you might have seen him at the very start of the video, the old dude that was sanding a bumper down, his name's Frankie, and he's got like a bit of a band, Frankie and the Rockets, and he wanted to get a bit of an intro made up, and he found one on Fiverr, so I saw it, and I'm like, man, that's really cool, I should upgrade my intro, and after upgrading it, I'm like, um, I got it, which you've obviously seen at the start of this video, and then I'm like, um, man, I better make some videos, so I'm still riding on that inspiration wave of having that new intro, so, well, I, I, I know you guys will be like, hey, Gunny, whatever it takes, we don't care, you know, just pump out the vids again, so, yeah, either way, all that aside, I've gone and edge masked the quarter panel, I've then thrown the piece of plastic over it, but I haven't actually finished the masking yet, so I haven't actually cut the masking out and taped it down yet, but what I'm doing here is going around and putting the wet on wet primer down, aka sealet, standox, non-stop uh, primer, so yeah, you put it down and then you wait for, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes until it's flushed off and then you can just continue on and put your colour straight down. Um, and yeah, this just helps seal it down, like let's just say Alan missed a 180 grit scratch from when he was blocking it, this is going to help fill that in, um, rather than getting your base coat down and then having to give it a um, yeah, scuff back, and it also helps with those little bits of 1k primer that I mentioned before, there was a few low spots on this door, um, and if I was to go and spray base coat over that 1k primer, for starters it wouldn't stick, um, and also you'd most likely, especially because I'm using solvent base, you'd most likely get some uh, shrink back or mapping. So yeah, you are really best off using two pack uh, primers for, uh, before you put your base coat down, especially with solvent base. Um, I found that, you know, when I was using water, you can spray over big cut throughs, like you, you can cut through three or four different layers of base coat and it's just not going to swell up because you don't have the solvents in there to sort of bite into those old layers of paint. And the gun I was using there was a bit of a channel favourite and a personal favourite. I'd still say the best budget gun on the market and that was the DeVilbis FLG5 1.4. Anyway, moving on with the job, I've got the wet on wet primer down and now I'm cutting out the masking. I would actually like to mention though quickly before I forget that yeah, you're best off with the wet on wet primers to use slow hardener in it. That's what I've been doing lately and it just helps it sort of flow out a little bit and um, yeah, I mean I actually don't like this Standox wet on wet primer as much as the Glazeret. Like I used that Glazeret wet on wet primer and it just went on like a coat of clear. It would flow and you would put your base coat down and it was just really nice whereas this stuff just I don't know it seems to pinch up a little bit more than the glazer it always used to and yeah I mean I used the glazer it stuff for years and absolutely loved it and then when I came to this shop here I actually didn't even use that when I'm at primer because I just didn't like the way it um, it dried and yeah it sort of made your jobs look a little bit worse but these days I just find that I have to use it it's just the best way around it and yeah, sure, it's not my favourite product, and I, I get people every now and then, they're like, oh, if you don't, if you know that Glazer it's better, then why do you use Stanox? Like, man, I'm an employee, I'm not going to go and tell my boss you have to go and get Gla Glazer it, you know, they've been using Stanox here for years, I'm not going to, like, start throwing my weight around and saying I'm, I'm going to quit it if you don't get Glazer it or something, I mean, yeah, come on, get with the real world. Um, but, yeah, no, nah, Stanox is actually, like, a, a great system, I, I like it, I'm... Um, it took a little bit to get the hang of that spectro, maybe two or three weeks, or I guess even longer to fully master it, but um, yeah, these days, man, I find the color matching system, uh, the color matching side of Standox with the spectro really quite easy, and yeah, as you get to know the system more, you know which tinters do what, and yeah, I really don't have any major issues with the Standox, um, and yeah, there we go, all the masking is done, and we're right to give it a wax and grease remover, so um, yeah, just using the Sontara wipes, use these blue wipes. They say that they're lint free, but they're not. <laughs> they're actually not. They're, they're clean, they're sterile, they're new, new rags, but they actually do leave some lint behind. So, you yeah, know, I always make sure I give them an extra good tack rag down my jobs. And yeah, one other thing I've been doing lately um, is just leaving my jobs a little bit longer between base coat and clear coat and just spending that little bit extra time on uh, tack ragging 
required to clear coat and yeah it does make a difference but honestly you guys can't really tell from a video how busy I am you might be like oh yeah you smashed that job out but you don't see the the hours of just busting busting a gut to get the jobs done that that I do every day um, yeah and sometimes you know 10 minutes or 5 minutes here makes the difference in between a job or two getting painted at the end of the day and you know yeah we've got to smash those jobs out so sometimes you're like yeah I know it's a little bit early but it's just tacked off get in there and bloody put the coat of clear on and get the next one in you know what I mean but um, yeah having Alan here back and from his shoulder injury has definitely helped me just be able to spend that little bit, an extra 10 minutes here, an extra 10 minutes there, but when we're undermanned, it really um, it really does get pretty hectic in this shop. But hey, we produce, we produce the results and um, usually keep the bosses pretty happy with the paint side anyway. So yeah, moving on to the base coat stage, I'm using the Dwilbers DV1 and as I mentioned before, using stand-up solvent base and yeah, I've been loving the DB1. I actually went back to the Pro, GTI Pro with T20 air cap on it um, last couple of weeks and I was just like, how bad was it? You know, like, is this DB1 really that much better than the Pro or the Pro lights that, you know? Um, and honestly, it is. You know, I went back to the, yeah, GTI Pro and I mean, it's capable. They do a good job, but this thing is just honestly effortless <laughs> for the base coat. So, personally don't prefer it for clear coat um, I still reckon my pro lights got got one up on it for clear but at the end of the day they do it they did actually advertise this gun as a base coat gun anyway so you know it, it's kind of fitting that it does spray base coat better um, yeah as I say you can use it for clear there's nothing to say that you can't use it for clear but yeah I just find it a better base coat gun so this is the DV1 HVLP plus 1.2 um, yeah that's the setup and the settings I run it around one bar sometimes a touch over rarely any under one bar um, and what's that about 14 psi but keep in mind that the digital gauge on these um, you see where it is it's actually reading the air pressure from a different point I've got a bit of a memo from Chris from Spray Guns Direct and I think it came from the Vilbus um, and they sent it out to him and then he, he forwarded it onto me saying that uh, yeah if you actually get a standard gauge on the base of the gun it'll read like one and a half bar whereas the um, digital gauge up the top there that'll read one bar or, or something around that I can't remember the exact conversion but there's something worth keeping in mind if you do have the digital version of the DV1 it will seem like you're using a lot lower pressure but you're probably actually not so you can obviously just go and calibrate that, or they do actually have a bit of a chart, but yeah, you can just go and st uh, put a standard cheetah valve or gauge down the bottom of your gun and have a look at both of the gauges and see what uh, what it's actually reading. So if you always want to say, hit that two bar mark on the base of the gun, then you can put that on the base of your gun and see what it reads at your digital gauge. So that was actually, I don't know, it's, uh, they, they did it for a reason, uh, supposedly in that memo, memo it said something like less moving parts or like they did have a good reason for it and like less maintenance and like it'll prolong the longevity of that gauge itself so yeah either way I, I do like the digital gauge now that I, I sort of got the hang of the pressure settings but yeah as, as I say like at the start when I first use it I'm like yeah I'm spraying this at 1.5 bar like spraying with really low pressure I mean I'm used to spraying with two bar pressure but yeah that's the reason because they, the digital gauges on the DV ones are actually a little bit out compared to your standard gauge reading it down the bottom um, all that aside yeah this thing just uh, hums along <laughs> with a nice big bound on it uh, I do actually have the HVLP as well but honestly the only time I'll ever use that is on a really coarse metallic or a really hot day so yeah, I mean, this is a hot day. It's like 30 degrees. I've been spraying with HVLP Plus and unless it's like extreme heat, like 35, 38, 40 degrees Celsius, which is, you know, like 100 degrees Fahrenheit, 
unless it's around those really hot temperatures, I won't even bother with the HVLP. So, I mean, I'm glad I've got it. I'm happy to have it, and it does get used a few times each year, but I, I mean, HVLP Plus is where it's at, and that's probably what I would recommend most people to get if you are looking at getting a DV1. But yeah, as far as the digital goes, as I say, it's one of those take it or leave it things. For me, I'm happy with a standard ANI $30 regulator down the bottom, and yeah, that, that keeps me happy. You don't need the digital, fancy digital gauges, but hey, I guess it's another plus thing. You can save yourself a bit of money and still get yourself that good gun by just putting one of these uh, analog uh, gauges down the bottom. And yeah, believe it or not, I was so happy to spray the sealer on this car with this gun. I'm like, you know what? I'm using it for clear. I walked out of the booth and I'm like, what gun am I going to use for clear today? Yeah, I'm bored of the Pro Light. I use it all the time. So I just thought, you know what? I'm going to get the FLG5 1.4 and clear this bad boy up. Why not? You know, as I say, this is a bit of a favourite of mine, this spray gun here. And you can see why. So this is running at 2 bar pressure. Um, and look, the amount of overspray that it pumps out is pretty minimal considering, you know, like if I was using the um, an SDI Water Lotus Supernova WS400, there will just be big clouds of overspray. So it's got a good transfer efficiency too. Like I've actually found it's right about on par with the Pro Light. So yeah, I've found it doesn't use any more, not so much any less either. But yeah, I mean, I don't think it's quite as good as my Pro Light. You know, I think the Pro Light is the better gun easily, but. It's definitely a good option for anyone out there who's looking at uh, a new gun but doesn't want to go and break the bank. You know, I'm, I used to spray base coats with it, I used to spray direct gloss VOCs with it, or you know, 2K direct gloss um, colors with it, and yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely up for the task. The fans are a touch smaller than the Pro Light, definitely a bit smaller than the DV1, so you know, it wouldn't be my go-to base coat gun, but it's definitely capable, you know. These guns are actually made in the UK now. They used to always be made in Brazil, and this gun here says made in Brazil on the side, but when I got it, it actually had the same box as the Pros and Pro Lights. So, don't know exactly what's going on with that one, but yeah, what I did actually hear is that Devilbus UK bought the machinery from GPI, I think it was. So GPI in Brazil were making these guns and then Dwilwis UK bought the machine off them. So now these are actually made in the UK. So there you go, a bit of random, uh, probably useless information, but that's yeah, a cool story. Like I've, I've recommended this gun to many people over the years. I know many people who have gone and bought this gun on my recommendation. Um, most of whom are very pleased with it and the results uh, and one guy recently is like oh I'm tossing up between this this and this guy and I said honestly man just get the FLG5 and thank me later and he was I took him a little bit of convincing he's like oh, I want one with low overspray high transfer efficiency and I think he was looking at getting a HVL power I'm like man forget about it just go and get this gun here and he got it and he's like oh man i'm blown away this thing is amazing i think he wanted it for primer so he got the 1.8 mil for primer with it and he's like man minimal overspray good transfer efficiency because i think he was spraying in the workshop or something like that and i said man this is perfect for you doesn't use too much air and yeah he was just um yeah just really thankful that i gave him the right advice and um yeah i mean i've had one guy i can't remember if he even bought the gun on my recommendation but he left a comment saying he doesn't like these guns. The only real piece of um, criticism that was any valid was that the, if you take the air cap off this gun, there's no um, retaining ring holding it to the uh, screw-on piece that goes onto the gun, if that makes sense. So if you take the air cap off this, it will break into two separate parts. And to me, that's just like, is that really a big deal? I don't know, man. Like, I don't even take the air cap off 99% of the time when I clean it. Like, I might take it off once a month, if that, to just give it a clean in behind there. But you don't need to, honestly. Like, I, yeah, I use my guns daily and keep them in good working order. And even when I do pull it off, most of the time, I barely even need it to be pull off, pulled off, you know what I mean? So, 
yeah there you go that's the job i hope you guys enjoyed watching this video hope you've learned something out of it um we just got a bit of entertainment out of it so yeah thanks for hanging around to the end if you did enjoy watching the video as always don't forget to give it a big thumbs up subscribe if you're new to the channel and be sure to go and check out my many of my other videos i've also got a second channel which yeah, i don't put as much time as effort and effort into that one it's basically just me with the GoPro on my head and taking you guys through the job as I go. Some people actually prefer it because it's more on, like, it's what's on my mind as I'm doing it. But yeah, obviously some people do prefer these edited and narrated videos. So yeah, you got your choices. Either way, that's the job there all finished off. Hope you guys enjoyed it. And until next time, get out there and paint some shit. Thanks for watching. And this has been another Gunman production. Goodbye.